What does chess have to do with scripture? Let's think about it. Hey, my name's Justin Harrell. I challenge you to challenge yourself to think about less taught biblical topics. The angel of the Lord, the visible Yahweh, was with Israel, guiding them out of Egypt and into their promised land. But that didn't stop the enemy from attacks. Both the seen and the unseen realms were hard at work trying to stop God's nation. Pharaoh's army tried to stop them and wipe them out at the Red Sea. Giants were awaiting them in the land promised to Abraham. And spiritual forces were provoking fear, division, and disobedience. No matter the cost, the enemy never gives up. The forces of darkness are always at war with God and his people. But God has a plan. A plan that nobody sees coming. There are things only God knows. When it comes to his plan of redemption, he keeps that classified for his eyes only. His plans will succeed. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 say, For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Nothing can stop what God has done, is doing, and will do. But this doesn't stop the fallen world from trying. Man and divine beings constantly try to thwart God's plans. But for every move, there's a counter move. Chess is a game of strategic skill that pits two minds against one another. Each player begins the game with 16 pieces that are moved and used to capture opposing pieces according to precise rules. The object is to put the opponent's king under direct attack, from which escape is impossible. What separates the expert players from the novices? The ability to see all the future moves the opponent can make. The ability to determine which moves your opponent is likeliest to make. The ability to plan counter moves to your opponent's attacks. Well, God is omniscient. He sees all the enemy's moves. He knows the enemy's thoughts and motives. He knows how to bait the enemy into doing his will. He has counter moves to all their moves in advance. This is the ultimate chess match. Move, counter move, move, counter move. All the other divine beings cannot outsmart God. Unknowingly, they end up just being pawns, fulfilling the will of God. Had they known God's plan, they wouldn't have participated. 1 Corinthians 2, 7-9 But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Though the prophets were given glimpses of the future redemption of man, they never quite understood it. No one could see clearly what God was going to do. Not even the rulers of darkness. A side note, a lot of times verse 9 is used to describe our knowledge of heaven and that no one knows what heaven will be like because eye has not seen or ear have heard the things that God has prepared for us. But in context, this is not about heaven. It's about knowing God's plan of redemption. And if you go on to read verse 10, it pretty much explains it for you. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So let me get this straight. It is revealed to us, the believers, through God's Spirit. Think about it. We all know what God did on the cross. We now understand God's plan of salvation. It's no longer a mystery. So clearly this passage is not about heaven. This is one of my pet peeves when we take a single verse out of context and then we arrive at a wrong conclusion 
And if we would just keep reading a little further in that same passage, it would explain it to us. The Bible pits two cities against one another, Babylon and Jerusalem. A city of pagan powers and a city of the Most High God. At one point, because of Israel's disobedience, God allows Babylon to conquer Jerusalem. The temple is destroyed and the people are carried away captive. It would seem that Jerusalem would never be God's place again. But it was only temporary, 70 years. God's commitment to this city is faithful and true, even with man's sin and failure. God has set up Jerusalem as his city. Now that puts a big target on its back. Until Jesus returns, this place will be at war with the unseen realm. Zechariah 8.3 Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. But Jesus hasn't returned yet. So the spiritual war is very much alive and active today. Babylon became a source of all kinds of pagan ideas and rituals that we still deal with to this day. Going forward, we're going to look at some of the ways that things that were once holy have now been tainted with paganism. And we're going to see some things we take for granted that are connected with paganism. It's something we're going to think about. <laughs>